The issue first surfaced nationally right after the Civil War with advocates believing compensation in the form of a mule apiece plus 40 acres of land would help erase the stain slavery left on America. Since that time, arguments for and against reparations have abounded. Are reparations valid? Is it too late? What form should reparations take? And is it just for African Americans? We'll talk about that and more with our guest William Darity Jr., the Boschimer Professor of Economics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Research Professor of Public Policy Studies at Duke University. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. The claim for reparations is, is no mythological claim. You say it dates back to 1865, to the end of the Civil War, when Union General um, William Sherman issued special orders, field orders number 15, that established the provision of, quote, not more than 40 acres of tillable ground designated for the settlement of Negroes now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the President of the United States. Why wasn't that carried out? Well, actually it was carried out initially for the uh, ex-slaves who had uh, accompanied Sherman's army to the coast of South Carolina and coast of Georgia. Um, it also was carried out for uh, ex-slaves who actually were living in the area along, along the coast, but it was only carried out temporarily. Uh, after Lincoln's assassination, Andrew Johnson succeeded him as president, and uh, Johnson made the decision that the land was to be restored to the former slaveholders, which, which it was. And uh, so as a consequence, that very first initiative lasted maybe approximately four to five months. Uh, then there were actually uh, components of the first Freedmen's Bureau Act as well as the Southern Homestead Act that had similar kinds of provisions for land redistribution to the ex-slaves, but those were never, never carried out. Now, why was President Andrew Johnson uh, so fiercely opposed to giving the land to the freed slaves? Well, although he was a unionist, he was uh, rapidly anti-black. Uh, and had a hostile attitude towards the status of the slaves, and so uh, the ex-slaves, and so as a consequence, he was opposed to any kind of significant redistribution of land that would have given them a grub stake in American society that they did not have at that point. If reparations had been fulfilled at that time, do you think we'd be talking about this today? How might things have been different? Well, we can only speculate, but uh, in my imagination, I think that had... Uh, that initial land allocation been made, it would have affected the long-term wealth, dis wealth distribution in this society by race quite, quite substantially. And possibly we would not have to ask about the question of reparations today. Now this debate in varying degrees of intensity has been ongoing since 1865. So we're talking 100, uh, some 142 years later, uh, people are still debating pro and con. And I'm wondering how likely do you think at this date uh, an official government apology and reparations are? Well, I, I don't know how likely it is. Uh, I know that if I was living in uh, South Africa in 1950 or 1955, I probably would think apartheid would never come to an end. And if I was in the United States in, say, 1930 or so, I might think that Jim Crow would never come to an end. So I'm never going to say it's impossible for such an outcome to come about. And I think uh, it's, it's desirable for us to have such an apology and such compensation forthcoming. Um, I would add that uh, in that 140 years, a substantial portion of that 140 years was devoted to the maintenance of legal segregation uh, or what we might call apartheid in the United States uh, throughout the southern states but also uh, in many aspects in the north as well and that is also an issue that should be raised in thinking about the reparations question so it's not just a question of reparations for slavery but it's also reparations for Jim Crow as well as ongoing discrimination in American society. Now you say there are three objectives uh, to your program for reparations for slavery. The first is acknowledgement, the second is redress, and the third is closure. In a nutshell, what do you mean by each of those? Okay. Acknowledgement is recognition that a major or grievous social injustice was done. Uh, redress means uh, trying to, uh, to, to the extent possible, uh, look in a forward way about how we can construct a situation where the opportunity structure for African Americans 
is e at least equivalent to that of, uh, of non-blacks in the society. Uh, and then uh, closure means uh, producing a set of circumstances where there is no longer a need for African Americans to make any race-based claims on the society. So I, by, by closure, I don't mean that we stop talking about this history, but that we would no longer have a situation where African Americans would come forward uh, demanding or requiring or requesting social programs that are specifically for African Americans. Now, the famous uh, psychoanalyst Carl Jung um, says that injustices become embedded in the psyche and they're passed on from generation to generation. Um, and I bring that up uh, as a preface to the fact that in, in 1998, a solemn President Clinton uh, on a visit to Africa stopped just short of an outright apology um, for America's part in the slave trade. In fact, he said, um, going back to the time before we were a nation, European Americans received the fruits of the slave trade, and we were wrong in that. Did his apology or his statement go far enough, and would an apology be enough? Well, and a, a formal apology would be desirable. Uh, I certainly don't think it's sufficient because uh, what, what the apology handles the concern, the first, the first aspect of the objectives, which is uh, acknowledgement, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, address the second two, which is redress and closure. And redress and closure really requires the development of a substantial program of reparations that would be uh, intended to eliminate the significant economic disparities that exist between uh, African Americans and non-African Americans in this society. And you think reparations would do that? Well, if, if designed properly, certainly. I mean, I, I, obviously I could conceive of a reparations program that's called that, that wouldn't really have much of an effect on, on anything, depending on the, the magnitude of the, of, of, of the compensation, depending on the way in which the program is executed. But a properly designed reparations program certainly could have the redistributive effects that could really alter the way in which we think about racial inequality in this society. I want to talk about a potential designs for a reparations program, but first I want to talk about some of the um, some of the arguments against reparations that have been out there and probably seen by more people. Okay. Um, first, opponents say that African chiefs were the ones waging war on each other and capturing their own people and selling them. Um, if uh, we abolished slavery more than 140 years ago, a war that took more American lives than any in our history, and according to one critic of reparations, if John Brown was correct that the sin of slavery could only be washed clean in blood, then it was done. How do you respond to that? Well, I, actually, this seems to be a mixture of arguments, but the, I think the first one concerns African complicity. Um, and I, I would argue that, first of all, African complicity only occurs after African opposition to the slave trade and slavery was, uh, was quashed. Uh, and there was a significant effort on the part of some African chieftains, including Queen and Zynga, to uh, resist the slave trade, uh, but they were defeated. So after their defeat, you have a situation in which I think Africans collectively are confronted with a prisoner's dilemma. Either you participate in the slave trade from the standpoint of being involved as traitors, or you are subject to being uh, the objects of the trade yourself, that you may be subjected to being enslaved and shipped overseas. So um, that prisoner's dilemma creates uh, a circumstance in which uh, I think it's, it's very difficult to talk about some sort of open or voluntaristic complicity on the part of Africans. Uh, the, the third thing I would say here is that it's the demand side that is always decisive in uh, what we might view as immoral or unethical trades. I mean, if we think about the drug trade, uh, people have, have frequently talked about trying to stem it from the supply side. But ultimately, if people want the product, then that's what's going to generate a supply for it. And I think similarly in the context of slavery and the slave trade, the European demand for s slave labor on the American continents was the, was the critical factor. And that's what we have to address. This is Pennsylvania Inside Out Issues. I'm Patty Satalia. Almost immediately following the Civil War, Union General William Sherman proposed that former slaves be given a mule apiece along with 40 acres of land on the coast of Georgia and South Carolina as a way of making amends for slavery. Since that time, the debate
debate over black reparations has continued with varying intensity. According to polls, public opinions on the matter seems to mirror the nation's parallel racial universes. Here to make the case for black reparations is Dr. William Darity, a professor of economics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and research professor of public, pol or public policy studies at Duke University. The other argument against reparations. Well, there, there was a second component, oh, okay. right, which was the uh, the question of whether or not the debt has really been paid by the blood that was lost during the course of the Civil War, and uh, I think there's there's uh, there's th that should be factored in. I mean, the 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 uh, the moral the moral claim that's associated with ending slavery is is a very important one, but on the other hand, uh, had slavery not been instituted, it had not been made a, a legal dimension of American life, there would have been no need to do that at all. Uh, so, uh, and furthermore, there was always the possibility that white male America, which white male America were the only individuals who could participate in the political process formally and at that point in time, white male America could have decided to end slavery without resorting to warfare. Uh, there were proposals afoot for compensated uh, emancipation of the slaves. Uh, that was a possibility that was was seriously and passionately advanced by Abraham Lincoln. So there were options other than going to war. They were not taken. The other argument against reparations that has gained the most attention is that the people currently asked to pay had nothing to do with the injustices of the past. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Well, there's actually... Uh, uh, several responses to that. Uh, first and foremost uh, is is the fact that uh, the injustices of, of the past are are not as distant as uh, we are accustomed to to thinking. If if we were to thinking about if we we're thinking about slavery itself, uh, my sons are the fifth generation out of slavery, and so if you think of it from a generational standpoint. Uh, it's not that, that far in the past. There are some families where there are still living members who are actually only the third generation from slavery. Those individuals are 100 years in age or, or older. But, uh, but again, from a generational standpoint, it's not that far back. But now if we also address the fact that subsequent to slavery, the United States did not immediately become a true democracy, but practiced 100 years of political exclusion of African Americans uh, through the Jim Crow system, uh, then we're talking about uh, a, a system that did not go out of existence in any formal way until 1964. And with respect to schools and school, deseg school desegregation, school desegregation really doesn't come into practice in the United States until the early 1970s. Uh, so now we're not talking about very, a very distant past, and we're not talking about uh, huge numbers of Americans who had nothing to do with, uh, with, with that process. Uh, but I would also add that for individuals who are more recent immigrants, I would argue that when one immigrates to a country, you immigrate to its history, and that you immigrate to the responsibilities and obligations that that, that society has, as well as the opportunities and benefits that it provides you. Speaking of benefits, uh, one of the numbers out there about uh, the profits made by slaves is uh, $9.12 billion using an annual interest rate of, of 5%. But when we talk about calculating the amount of reparations. Um, some calculations are as high as four trillion dollars and some say that's a, a, an underestimate. How would you calculate this and to whom or how would the monies be dispersed or distributed? Okay. So let, let me first of all say that uh, I, with respect to who would be eligible to receive reparations, I have uh, come come to the view, uh, after, after long conversations with my, with my wife actually, uh, I've come to the view that there should be two criteria. Uh, the first is that the uh, individual should have to establish that he or she had an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. And then the second criteria would be that the individual would have to indicate that for at least 10 years before the onset of the reparations program, that in some official document that he or she indicated that they were racially either black, colored, Negro, or African American. Okay. So that's who would be eligible. Uh, in terms of the magnitude, the baseline from my perspective 
is the present value of the 40 acres and the implements or the mule. Uh, the present value of the 40 acres that was to be distributed to the 4 million ex-slaves at the time of emancipation. And then we can think about how that number should be increased to adjust for the, the social penalties associated with uh, Jim Crow and ongoing discrimination. But that would be the baseline. And yes, the numbers could get quite huge. They could be in the vicinity of 3 to $6 trillion. Uh, final thing is, how should this be paid? I think in terms of reparations as constituting a portfolio of options so that there would be a total sum, but the total sum could be distributed partially in terms of checks to individual African Americans that might be distributed over a period of years, not necessarily one point in time. It could also include a trust fund that people could draw upon if they have projects that have merit uh, to develop their, 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 their businesses or, or to use those resources to further their education. Uh, there could be some form of tax relief. I mean, there could be a variety of ways we could do this. There's nothing that commits us to having a reparations program that takes a single form. In fact, you talked about using the model that the Germans used in compensating Holocaust victims, which turned out to be payments of $100 a month. To um, individuals. To individuals. And also there were payments made to an institution, to the State of Israel, uh, to assist it in its development and survival. So you could have some forms of institution building that might take place as a part of the overall reparations package. So I'm fairly open-minded about how, how this might be done as long as it has the constructive aim of closing the disparities that exist in this society. Now, we do have some experience with paying reparations. Uh, Japanese Americans who were interned after World War, during World War II, um, were 24 years later, um, received reparations for property lost. And then in 1988, some 60,000 people received payments of $20,000. That seems like a, um, uh, and, and that was by legislation of, of U.S. Congress. Yeah. It seems doable, almost, and I'm wondering how many people were talking about using the eligibility guidelines you talked about, um, having identified yourself as African American or Negro within the last 10 years. How big a population are we talking about? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not certain. I mean, if, if I were to look at census estimates of the number of individuals who might be identified as black or African American in the United States, then we're talking about approximately uh, 22 million people to 25 million people. But in terms of the numbers who could actually meet both of the criteria, then I'm, I, I would assume it would be somewhat smaller than that. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a much larger potential population that would be the target population than the recipients of reparations for the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And some would say if we were to do what you have just uh, outlined, we would bankrupt the U.S.? Well, if we're talking about three to six trillion dollars as a sort of a rough range, the national debt is larger than that. So uh, depending upon how you executed the program, uh, if the payments are not made all at one point in time and if they take the form of programs, include programs like trust funds and the like, then I, I certainly think it's feasible to do it. Mm -hmm. The National uh, Urban League and the NAACP have not officially backed reparations. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I suspect it's because uh, there, there still is this sentiment among some elements of the African American community that this is impossible, it's pie in the sky, and uh, that in some ways their credibility are, will not be taken as seriously if they commit themselves to this, this option. But again, I say there are many things that we have thought were unlikely to occur that are morally correct and are probably policy-wise quite correct uh, that, that, that we didn't think would occur that, that actually have come to pass. And so uh, I, I would hope that eventually those, those, those organizations would support this as well. We have just a couple of seconds, but you yourself have said that the task of building a national movement of black reparations is daunting. Yes. Where, where do you go from here, and, and, and how much company do you have? Well, there, there are, are people who have been in pursuit of this goal for many, many years, uh, like the organization in COBRA that uh, has a, a wonderful lawyer who works with them, Adjua Ayatoro, who has been talking about this. There are attorneys who have been pursuing litigation around reparations, including Charles Ogletree. 
So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not alone in, in pursuing this, uh, but uh, I think that the best we can do is continue to try to have opportunities to engage in conversations to help people understand that this is not an absolutely absurd idea, uh, that it is a way of addressing our nation's tortured history around slavery and racism, and that it creates the possibility for us bringing to a close or, or to a reconciliation uh, around these issues in a way that, that we have not been able to in the absence of a reparations program. All right. Thank you so much for talking with us. Glad.